Uh, hey everybody, I'm Will Scott, the painter here at Graveyard Cars. <laughs> I heard you guys are missing more episodes. Oh, What's yeah. up with that? We're on at the same time every week, same day. What, what are you doing, Will? I'm going home. What do you mean you're going home? No, we need you. You guys, Go. Nice tune in. I I'm out. Have a nice day. Good luck painting without me. Anyways, we're coming on next. Previously, Mark and the Ghouls revealed the 1970 Lemon Twist Roadrunner to its happy customers. This time, the ghouls crack down on John Buck's SEMA Challenger, and Mark and his cousin Dougie build out the engine for the super rare one of eight 1971 in violet Plymouth Cuda. They're, com they're coming to get you, Barbara. The unburied dead are coming back to life. I'm Mark Warman. And together, we bring dead muscle cars back to life. To exactly the way they were on the day they were born. So now that I got our 1970 Challenger SE over to Dave, I took it off the whirly jig, put it on the bin pack, got that wrapped up. Now this week, I went ahead and went through and got the hood scoops, all the little parts and pieces that he usually gets later. I went ahead and got them done now. Got them over to Dave the past couple days. I got the hood left, I'm buffing it right now. Take the hood over today, uh, get the hood on there, get it lined up perfect. Then Dave has that car 100% to start assembling. On our 70 Challenger RT, it's actually a special edition. I mean, this is RTSC. So what happens is the VIN number changes. It goes from a JS23, which is what it would have been just as an RT, to a JS29, which means it's got the formal roof, which is part of the A47 uh, SE package. They only made 733 of these cars with a 440 and an automatic. So you're getting down into the pretty rare numbers with that one. The interior is mostly original. We do have to freshen up the front seats, but the owner wanted to leave it as close to original interior-wise as possible. The car is an original FF4 green, kind of an interesting color. It also has the body side moldings versus a stripe package that could have been available or stripe delete. One of the things this gentleman wanted to do was the car was not a factory sound deadener car, meaning it wasn't a factory undercoating car. So what Will did was he emulated the original look by painting the bottom of the car the actual gray color that the dipping primer would have been and then just oversprayed it, let the overspray hit it. So when you look underneath this car, it's pretty darn close to the way it would have started life back in 1970. I think that what's gonna happen when we're done is he's gonna have kind of a mix of the correctly done beautiful exterior of the car under the hood, but on the interior, there's a lot of original DNA. And I think because he has so much history with it, the owner, he wanted to keep it that way and I understand that. So now that this car is out of my life, I have a 69 GTX a Seafoam Green one, which is a gorgeous color. So the pre-paint's all been done on that, so I'm gonna start blocking that out so I can do final paint properly beginning of next week. So I'll have that to do over today here in the next couple weeks. The 71 Cuda convertible was sent to me a couple of years ago. Got it disassembled, sent it out, and had it dipped. A lot of metal replacement on that car. It's a big dollar car, well into the six figures. It's not a special order car. Somebody ordered it this way to put it into inventory. That's what the sales code tells us. But it is FC7. This one has a white convertible top. It's also power, which was an option. They also put it over the top of a white guts. So you've got a inviolate 71 Cuda 340 three speed, one of eight ever made. How many of those eight were plum crazy or inviolate with white interior? My guess is it's probably the only one. You could very easily be down to a one of one car. So today, Doug and I are getting ready to uh, put together the 1971 340. This is the engine that came out of our 71 Cuda 340 three speed car. Mm -hmm. Did you get a seat before it came apart? No. It's a pretty cool car, yep. And just, just before I get started here, what we're gonna do, take a guess how many 71 Cuda 343 speed convertibles were built. Just a guess, a wild guess. Wild guess, 800. That's not a bad guess. You're, you're almost right. Drop the last two zeros. Eight. Eight? Eight. Eight were made. 
20 with a 344 speed and 140 total convertible 340 cars. Wow. Yeah, the rest were autos, so pretty rare. Anyway, I want to do the heads, intake. We're going to go ahead and set the distributor because we're going to get it out and we're going to put it on the engine run stand. Build out the front with the timing cover. We can go ahead and put the carburetor on it, exhaust manifolds, oil pan, get this thing completely ready so that when it comes off the engine run stand, we can send it over to Will. He can paint it, and they'll be ready to go on the, on the rest of the assembly stand. So you got Sweet. it? Sweet. Cut and Dougie. <laughs> back. Back by popular demand. Yeah. Cut and Dougie is back, right? He, uh, Cut and Dougie, he demand. <laughs> he was with me a couple of years ago, about, about three or four years ago, he was working with us, helped us work on the yellow AAR. Uh, that we were working on and back in the day the the phantasm cuda i felt like with his knowledge and experience and with his caution and care that he always exercises he'd be perfect for building out these drive trains so i talked to him made an offer and i think it was a winner for both of us all the way around and it's really nice to have him back dougie once held a 22 shell up in his fingers like this <laughs> struck a match and held it underneath there until it exploded in his face and when he was asked why he did it, he said, wah. That was his answer when he was, remember? Wah. Yeah, you say wah. Wah. I'd say, go get this, and he'd go wah. Wah. Which wah. was why. Why? Okay. Why did I do that? Because you could. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story, by the way. Blew his face off. That didn't even, that didn't even his original face. You should see a picture of him as a kid. Bright carrot orange hair, which is why we called him Rooster, because of the Rolling Stones little red rooster. When he was 16, he got a little, little orange cookie duster right here, a little mustache. Kind of looked like Danny Bonaduce from the Parches family. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, he's kind of, you had a little her nose, too. Well, thank you. They say two things keep growing on a man as he gets older. <laughs> Your nose is like that. You should be in the wrong business, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> okay, I'm going to get the head gasket. You get the head. The 340 was introduced in 1968. It weighed bye-bye in 1973. Now, it, it, it ran the gamut in that period of time. 68 to 70 typically are the more desirable ones. They're the higher horsepower. Getting to 70, getting your AAR and your TA Challengers, it had a, a three Holly two-barrel setup on it. And that's, that's pretty cool. It's the only small block to ever leave the factory with multiple carburetors. Uh, fast forward to 71, they did start to detune things a little bit. Compression came down a little bit. 72, 73 really was the end of it. Compression was down. They weren't performing like they did in 68 and 69 and 70. Uh, but truly a time-honored respect for the 340. And I don't care who you are or where you are, if you've ran a 340 with whatever you were driving, you learn to respect that engine, especially, like I say, the 68 to 70. I, I lost a few races to a couple of Challenger 344 speed cars, and I had a 440 in mine out of a uh, 69 GTX. And, and they, they whooped my tail, so give it up. You have the torque sequence, bud? Yeah. What is it? I don't see a piece of paper with it written down anywhere. Well, you're gonna have to get one for me. Well, do you know the torque sequence? I don't sequence? have one. Well, how do you know how they go? Crisscross. Crisscross? Yeah. And I'm gonna take advice from the guy who blew his face <clears throat> off with a 22 shell, okay? When you're torquing down a cylinder head, or for that matter, anything, there's a reason there is a torque specification, which is the amount of foot-pounds that you're gonna put on that bolt. There's also a reason that there's a sequence for it. They want you to work on a cylinder head from the inside evenly out until you have all the bolts tightened down in series to the right spec. If you don't do it, what you can tend to do is warp that cylinder head a little bit. He's gonna tighten the heads down here and do the torque sequence on them, basically, because he's uh, what we call camera shy. He's, you can see the pattern on the small blocks really easy. One in the center, one right below it. Then you just work your way out. And then there, and then there, and there. And you'd have it. So, of course, not that hole, the one right below it. Okay. Well, our 70 Dodge Challenger uh, is pretty well buttoned up. Uh, Mark's just got to take it down to get an alignment. So while that car is out of the shop, I'm going to start banging away on our 70 Superbird Tribute car. A lot of people ask, well, what's a Tribute car? Uh, what a Tribute car is, we actually took a 70 Roadrunner and we converted it into a 70 Superbird. So some people call it a clone. Uh, we like to call it a Tribute. It sounds a little bit better. So we're actually paying tribute 
to an original 70 Superbird by converting the 70 Roadrunner into a Superbird. What I kind of did is I got a blanket in here, you know, just kind of protect the paint and protect me. But you can see the, the firewall's pretty bare on the inside. So uh, I'm gonna work on getting my pedal assembly in there today uh, and my firewall insulation, my under dash insulation, and then uh, work on getting that heater box restored and put back in. But right now I'm just gonna start with these studs right here. These studs go and actually hold up your steering column, but I'm gonna end up be poking my arms and everything on them and I need them off for when I put the dash in anyway. So I'm gonna get them off. And I'll take care of those and do the other one. Once I get my pedal assembly in there, I gotta figure out, make sure I got all my reinforcement brackets. I gotta get in my wiper arm assembly and all that too, so. So now I'm gonna go grab my pedal assembly. I'm gonna go ahead and get that put in first. That's that one that I converted over to a four speed. This left side piece comes over pretty far, so. I mean, I could put it in after the pedal's in there, but so you can see this little slot right here. It'll go right around this tab right here. I want to make sure I keep it somewhat straight here. And that's your underdash insulation. So I got to get all this and hope it all bolts up right. That looks good. Stay tuned. Mark and Cousin Duct Tape build out the 340 engine. Will assists with metal work. And Dave begins to wrap up our 1970 Plum Crazy Challenger. What size are those, Doug? 11 sixteenths. Three quarters, I'm sorry. Oh, three quarters. Okay. No problem uh, at all. Oh man, no way. You fit, huh? No, sir. So what's happened on these small blocks is this area in here between the valves is so tight, right in here, that we can't use our normal half inch drive socket on it. <clears throat> and these actually take 95 foot pounds of torque. A big block of 440 would only take 85. This actually takes more torque, probably because there's less bolts. This same three quarter socket that fits these head bolts like this won't go between these valves right here. So we've got to cut down from a half inch drive to a 3 8 drive that'll go down in there. But that's a lot of torque on a little 3 8 socket. It won't hurt it. These are good sockets. But it'll mean that he has to use our 3 8 torque wrench instead of our nice long handled lots of leverage half inch. So. OK. All right. So he's going to tighten that down to 95, 45 foot pounds at first, he'll do both sides, and then he'll move over and do it to 95. Is it at 45? Yes. Pull constantly until those lights go all the way up the row here, and then it'll beep at you. Whoa, that was easy. One of the things that's cool that uh, I actually learned from Doug we'll call him the bullet man, is he likes to tack his gaskets on to the part hours ahead of time. And so this thing isn't flopping around in the breeze moving. And that's one of the things that the sealer allow it to do. So he gets this on the mated surface and it can't move now. It's all lined up perfectly. He's ready to put the bolts in, gonna be no problems at all. He's done that with everything. The timing cover, He's got the gasket on the timing cover ready to go on, so it's glued into place. It won't slip and slide around. Valve cover, same thing. Got all these gaskets in place. They're glued in place with a sealer, so that won't come back off. He can put that down on there. We won't use a sealer on this side. We won't need it because it's going against a, a cast head. But that's a great idea, doing it that way. I, I actually just never thought of doing it. So what we do is we disassemble the engines here complete. Bolt, unbolt all the things off of it, such as the accessories, get it down to the bare long block. We take the heads off, we disassemble the short block, and then we take it over to the machine shop. Machine shop rebuilds the short block and rebuilds the heads. They actually assemble the short block for us. They assemble the heads, but they don't put them on. And the main reason for that is when it comes time to put cylinder heads on, especially on your big blocks, that's where I come in. That's where our knowledge of what 
spark plug wire separator, what ignition bracket, what, what hose holder, what cable holder, what routing, what bolts, all those things that I get paid to know, they can't possibly know. So we just let them build the short block out and we build the rest of it here. good there and go out here and make sure it didn't do anything crazy out there in the firewall. Make sure my master cylinder doesn't suck through something there. Yeah, I still got to do a lot of plumbing in here. Make sure that pedal looks like she's nice and free. So now I'm going to work on getting my firewall insulation here. So. If you look over here, like up in here, you can see I do have the double hole up there alongside that. So I'm going to take off this whole chunk here. And I'm also going to poke out that hole there. So and you can see how it accesses all my little holes and stuff in there. And there's little places for the heater box that'll get in the way. But the under dash insulation and the firewall insulation pad. Uh, what that does is it protects the firewall uh, from the heater box. The heater box goes up against that. It's like a cushion in between the firewall and the heater box. So it protects the heater box and it also insulates and sound deadens uh, all the noise coming from the inch compartment into the cabin of the car. The stud's only going in that far, so you don't really need to drill into these things really good. I can kind of tell when they go in there if they're right or not. You got to hit them just square. There you go, just like that. You can see they give you these here as a standard, you know, replacement with the pad, and they'll work just fine. But this is the actual original OE, original equipment uh, firewall nail that they use. So these are the ones we always use. All right, so there you go. Firewall pad complete. Now I'm going to do my shorty. It's got this relief cut out for your parking brake because it's got to go right there. But if you look at this right here, this one's set up for an automatic. So if my four speed, remember that extra bracket I put in there? I got to cut this dude out like so. So that piece is gone. And now I'm good to get her in there around my four speed plate. I like it. There you have it. The firewall installation went super easy. It's great having quality parts uh, at our disposal. Uh, the firewall nails are actually all OE correct, so they go in so smoothly and they look period correct. So it's always nice having all those great quality aftermarket parts. So I'm getting ready to hang the quarters on John Buck's SEMA car. And I'm gonna grab Will. He's a little bit trouble sometimes, but when I really need him, he's good for a tight spot. Take the ass in. I'll hang the. Oh, what have you done? What are you doing? Do you know what you're doing today? Nope. Okay. I'm going to hang up on I the know. front first. I know, Tiger. Sweet oh. hell. You know, I'm not sure why George asked me to help. I, got, I am slammed as it is. You want me to push this in? Yeah. So this goes inside of this? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, on my oh. cart. Oh, there it is. With the way George keeps his work area in his toolbox, I only imagine what his house looks like. Very disorganized, George. Your what? Your, no, not me. Your cart is very disorganized. Yes, it happens. Hey. Need one more? Yeah, one more. Very disorganized. Will, when you're bouncing from car to car. This is the only car you're on, Tiger. I think I can see three more in the shop. I can see 30 cars as I'm working I mean, on them. Focus. Hey, ghouls, I got a good true or false for you. All right. True or false, the 1968 to 1971 Dodge Super B was available with only one stripe, and that particular stripe was a bumblebee stripe. That answer is going to be coming up right after the break. Okay, what say ye fellow ghouls? 
Was it true or was it false? If you guessed false, you were correct. 1968-1969 Super B was a Bumblebee style stripe. On the quarters, it sported the Bumblebee logo. In 1970, still had the Bumblebee logo on the quarter, but the stripe was a reverse C-shaped stripe. Odd looking thing. Actually looked like they stopped it at the quarters when they should have carried it into the doors. And then it was a longitudinal stripe in 1971, which also came with a blackout in the hood, and the Super B was now up in the middle of the hood. So there you go, there's your Super B trivia from the ice tray, the ice man. So Doug's bolting together the 340 for the CUDA. Uh, I'm just kind of here for moral support, watching over, making sure everything's exactly, because this is his first small block since he's been here. But uh, doing a good job and it's going together well. Half or nine? Half. Okay. Okay, ready for the next one? Once he sets that other one on there, then he will take his uh, torque wrench out and torque these things down to spec. Boy, those are a lot more cooperative than the big blocks, aren't they? Yes. <laughs> For whatever reason. <laughs> I don't know why, but they sure seem to be. Right. Okay. Beautiful. Let's put the intake manifold on. He once outran the cops on a Honda 750. You remember that? You want to talk about that? I think the statute of limitations has expired on that. That was the late 70s. I don't think anybody's looking for that Honda anymore. Beautiful, look at that. Beautiful. Oh, look at that. Starts right in there, nice. Oh, cousin Dougie doing it all. Dougie wasn't as sanitary as a kid when it came to mechanics. He did a lot of what we call butchering. Wait, here, I'll hold it just like this. You ready? Mm -hmm. Watching George pound anything is, is funny. Uh, but metal's not want something that you need to pound. These things should just basically just fall together. If the metal work's done right from start to finish, you don't need to beat anything as hard as George does. So sometimes when I go to fit the rear quarters, like on a CUDA, for instance, I act like I'm hitting it hard with my fist, but honestly, I'm not. Oh, yeah. Night and day difference. If you ever had to hang a quarter, it's tough. There's nothing easy about it because it's got to be on the money because it's a final product. Oh, shit. That would have sucked right in your face. Oh, God. There we go. You're welcome. The car's coming together great. Quarter panel took a little bit of work, but George got those big, curious muscles, got it popped right into place. Now it's time to clamp it down and start welding it up. Number two slipper. Hold on, let me get you another pair, buddy. Yeah, these, these pairs suck. Yeah. You were never a Boy Scout, were you? Coming up, Dave continues working on our 1970 Tribute Superbird, and Mark doesn't stop reminiscing about the golden years as they finish up the restoration on the super rare 1971 Inviolate Plymouth Cuda. The 340 cubic inch engine was first introduced in model year 1968. While many viewed it as simply a larger version of the 318 that was standard on Mopars at the time, mainly due to it being cast from the same engine block, in truth, the two engines were very different. Differences included a double roller timing chain, a windage tray to improve top-end engine RPM by keeping the crank counterweights from churning the oil, larger high-flow exhaust manifolds, a viscous fan drive to cut power loss at high speeds, and stronger connecting rods, just to name a few. In 1969, the engine was left pretty much as is, but in mid-1970, Mopar added a higher performance version of the 340. This version included three two-barrel carburetors sitting on the high-rise intake. Dodge called the new version the 346 pack, while Plymouth called it the 346 barrel. These special motors had heavier engine blocks, identified by a TA on the side, only used in the Plymouth CUDA AAR and the Dodge Challenger Trans Am. These motors were part of what is known as a package car. Rated at 290 horsepower compared to the 275 horsepower of the normal 344 barrel version. They had a lot more pep in their step. Available for only a short time, these two package cars and the engines that made them unique were never offered by the factory in that configuration again. So far, Dave has nearly wrapped up our Plum Crazy Challenger. Will and George have begun the metalwork on John Buck's SEMA car. 
and Mark and Dougie have started to build out the 340 to the ultra rare 1971 inviolate Plymouth Cuda. One night, he decides he wants to take his wife to be out to the drive-in. I said, okay, I get it. He, all he had was that Honda 750, the cop runner, we called it. He wanted to borrow my charger, my beautiful 1970 Dodge Charger. Innocent, innocent Dodge Charger. So I traded him the Honda 750 for the night, and he took my Dodge Charger, and he took his girlfriend out. I assume they had a great time because my car was trashed when they brought it back. <laughs> candy and wrappers all over the damn place. It just looked like a, a non-stop party, out of gas. I got his Honda that night, so I take his Honda. I go, that's cool, man. I'm gonna go out and ch check out the, the chick scene on Main Street. So I hops on the Honda 750, and I'm honking along. It's fast bike. Had a Kirker 4 one header. It was fast bike. I'm cruising about 36th Street, and there's some chicks, some honeys, some babes, some squeezes. You know what I'm talking about? Some mamas on the corner over there, and, and they're like, ooh, he just comes warm and he's the best, you know, and they're screaming, throwing the panties and everything, right? I honks on that throttle. Third gear, front end starts to come up, I'm back off the back, because he likes to armor all the seat. I'm hanging off the back of it. I go to let off the gas, doesn't shut off. Throttle stuck wide open. All the way to 42nd, I'm doing 120 miles an hour through the intersection by the time the throttle decided to let off. I asked Doug about it, he says, never did it to me. Well, what are the odds that it would do it to me? What did I do wrong? How far past full open did you pull that throttle? Well, I didn't put a pair of vice grips on it and stand on it. I mean, I just ran my wrist. You were stronger than I was. Yeah, almost killed me. And he was happy. <laughs> he loved it. <laughs> wow. You know what, when you have a history with somebody, it's kind of fun to relive it. And it's even funner because you can add a little bit of, you know, seasonings to it, right? Because the original story, while palatable, isn't nearly as good as the time I'm done with it with all my little dressings on there, a little cayenne pepper, a little salt, you know, maybe dress it out with some parsley around the sides of it. Makes it a more robust story. I won't be getting If I had, back. I'd have been dead. All right, let's put the timing cover on. That's okay, go ahead. Intake? Yeah, go ahead. Good memories, growed up together. We that was had, a good memory for you. We had uh, we had a mutual uncle, Uncle Wayne. Uncle Wayne was a hater. I don't think a hater is somebody who shares their opinion and is genuinely trying to maybe help you do a better job on something. Uncle Wayne was one of the original haters, long before all this hating stuff nowadays. He was one of the original haters. I think that a true hater is that the person they're hating on couldn't do anything right. Everything they do is wrong just for the spirit of it being wrong because they're a miserable human being and they like to make other people miserable. That's a true spirit of a hater. He'd hate on a guy till he's all played out. Hate on everybody, hate on his kids, hate on the guy at the store, hate on everybody. We're in a no hate zone here. Hater, just a hater. Wayne had a 1974 AMC Matador that he thought was the fastest car in the world. Everything else was junk by comparison. My Charger, his Barracuda, all junk compared to that Matador. Yeah, called us bad names. Bad names. But he loved us, I think. Look at that, Will. Plenty of room to go backwards if we want. The reveal is good. That's nice and tight. So it was a real big challenge getting the fender to line up with the door, but I finally got it. I mean, we only got three months left, so it's just in the nick of time. That's good because it was tight up here. Yep. So we, we can move that, that backwards. Door back a little bit. There's that. Cool. Thank you, Will. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm glad we got the uh, fender all aligned. Looks great. Uh, but now we just got to keep chasing, you know, door, go to the other side. You know, it's, it's a pretty big job. But next time, because it does take so long, I hope he just grabs Adam, because he just kind of stood around and watched us the whole time. So what was the very first year that the hood blackout treatment, the V21 it came to be known as, was available on the Mopar muscle cars? Was it the Dodge Super B in 1969, the Barracuda in 1967, or the Roadrunner GTX in 1968? The answer is coming up after the break. So what was the very first year for the hood sport treatment? It was 1968. It was on the Roadrunner and the GTX. 
Barracuda in that year certainly never had it, never had it in any years to be honest. The 1969 Dodge Super B, now that's a cool car, but it never had the blackout hood treatment on it. A 69 and a half A12 car did have a completely black hood, but that was a fiberglass liftoff. And in 1967, the GTX did have stripes on the hood and on the deck lid, but they were painted on and they were considered to be part of the sports package for the GTX. The timing cover he's putting on right now goes on first and then the water pump over the top of that. Okay. Could have probably figured that out earlier on. Seems like it's going, huh? Yeah. Turn it out and redo it. Nope, just go ahead. Where's the thing? And then there should be the water pump one next. <clears throat> the water pump helps seal that. So. Okay. Okay, go ahead and put your dope on that. As I expected, Doug's doing a great job on the 340. It's his cup of tea, right? I mean, that's, that's his thing. He was a small block guy. Growing up, I was always a big block guy. Um, it's fun to reminisce about those days, too. It's kind of funny, almost like we've come full circle and we're back all working on Mopars like we were as kids, except now we get paid to. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to leave him be, let him finish it out. Uh, it's going really well. Uh, I'll check back in with him tomorrow, see how he's doing, because we do got to get it down to the paint shop and back over to the build room so we can get it built out for the car. I'm working on our 70 Superbird tribute car, getting ready to put the side markers in. Side markers are very unique on this car, being that it has a 70 Cornet side marker on the front and a 70 Roadrunner side marker on the rear of the car. So it just seems like a really small component, but once you put it on the car, it really makes the car pop. And here's our bezels and our lens, and here's our rears. So if you kind of notice, it's kind of goofy having a chrome bezel on the front and a painted bezel on the back. Reason being, this is a 70 Superbird. And the 70 Superbird has 70 Dodge Cornet front fenders on it. So that front bezel is chrome in 1970 on the Cornet. So that's the one of the distinguishing features uh, of a 70 Superbird besides the nose, the crazy nose and the wing. So normally, our uh, 70 Roadrunner, which this car basically started life as, would have uh, painted bezels for the side markers of the front and the rear. But in the case of our Superbird, it's unique because this is our front and that's our rear. So really cool setup there, but I'm gonna put these babies together. So what you got here is you got some of your screws, your fasteners, and then you got your pigtails. And these pigtails go in there, as you can see, they don't screw in, they don't do anything you got to kind of smash them in there. Whenever you bend these tabs around on the inside, it actually creates a connection to make a ground in there. I'm sure when they did it from the company that did the lights back in the day, they just got a deal. They put it in there and go and press it right down. But uh, I don't have that. Yep, you can see where I bent all those little tabs all the way around in that and they're hammered down onto that edge. So that's gonna do two things. It's gonna one, hold the socket in there, and two, it's gonna create that ground that we need to make this light function, so. So we got our other one here done. I just put my gasket in. Now I'm gonna go ahead and put my light bulb in. Make sure she's in there good. You got some dielectric grease in there. Keep it from corroding. So it'll last a long time. Those two there before our rear ones, and they'll actually go in our harness, so we won't have the pigtails. They'll go in the harness and they'll snap right into the back of that dude right here. So, when it comes to doing side markers and emblems and trim and whatnot on the car, anything that goes on the painted surface is always a little bit stressful because you never know if something's going to slip while you're installing it and chip the paint. So you just got to be extra careful, make sure all your gaskets are in place and it's all put on properly. Top, top, 
Throw that baby on there, make sure my tabs are lined up good, and bammo. So I got my backing plate there, my keeper. I'm gonna get my light in there, just like so. Cap nuts in there. This dude goes through the hole there in that. So I try to leave these a little loose, because you can kind of play around with these and get them centered in the hole there. That looks actually really good. All right, and then that baby looks nice. And then what I gotta do is plug in my connection here, but I wanna put a little dielectric grease on that. And I'll take that dude just like that. Put those together like so. Bammo, there you have it. So there we have our 1970 Superbird, which is also a 1970 Dodge Cornet front fender side marker light and as you can look straight across over there there's our 1970 roadrunner and this is basically a 70 roadrunner but you can see the side marker light on that is a 70 roadrunner fender and so it's got that painted bezel just like our rear one does but since we're using a 70 coronet front fender on a 70 superbird it gets that 70 dodge coronet side marker light which has the chrome bezel so it'll look kind of funny having a chrome bezel on the front and a painted bezel on the back but that's the way it was on the 70 Superbird. So, a little trivia there for you. Superbird Tribute's coming along really well. Uh, I just gotta finish putting these side marker lights on, then I'll move on to the next stage. Right now, I'm just basically checking in with Doug to see how he's doing on the 340. So this is that little 71 340 he's been working on, his cup of tea, right? So uh, I just want to check in and see if he has any questions on it, uh, if there's anything I can do to help him. But uh, I would imagine he's moving pretty well on it now. Rooster! They yes, called the little red rooster. That's what Mickey Jagger called him. Where the rooster? Ha <laughs> ha! This little motor we built back exactly the way it was from the factory. It's a stock replacement piston. We did go a little bit larger on the camshaft, but everything else for the most part is exactly the way it's supposed to be, like the way it left the factory. In this particular case, it's because you've got a car that was one of only eight made. If you go, if you break down how many 340, three-speed manual transmission, which by the way was the standard, that was standard, so if you walked in and you said, I want a, a 1971 CUDA 340 and I need the cheapest one on the planet, this one I don't think was, but if you said that, you would end up with the manual transmission. That manual transmission today, while real nerdy back in the day and, and a poor man's CUDA, is a very rare car. One of only eight. Eight total in the world ever made 340 with three speed. They didn't build many 71 340 CUDA convertibles period. If you go into the four speed, if you did have a little extra change and you went in and you said, I want the four speed, they made 30 of those. And maybe you said, well, I want the automatic because uh, I, I, I like a little girly shifter down there, whatever it is, I like four speeds. They made 102 of those. So you're talking about a very, very rare car. I mean, think about how many states were in the union in 1971. I mean, not every dealership even got one of these cars. So it's pretty, pretty rare, pretty unique car. Hey, look at you rocking out. Oh, that looks really good. So, what do you have left? You got? I just need to put the belts and uh, power steering return line on, and I'm waiting for a carburetor. You got an upper radiator? Yeah, I don't have this yet. I got to get hold of Scott Smith. He was looking for me one. It's a thermal quad. And you need the engine wiring harness, because I th don't think I did get that no, yet. No, no. And you got the shifter back? Look at that. Got a shifter. That's cute. Isn't it? That's an adorable little set of little three speed. I love it. That means it's only got two shift rods. Uh huh. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Look, Look at that here. little shift. Look at that little shift. Look at that little shift. Looks like a pool ball. It's just cute as can be. Look at that. I like it. Look at that little shift. That little three speed shift. Got a little shift ball going on top of it. Put a little shift ball going on. Yeah. Put a little shift ball. Looks like an eight ball, doesn't it? You gotta put an eight ball on it. It's gonna be cute. I got to do it. I got to do it. I you gonna assemble that for me? Oh, this is the original ball. Look at that. Apparently nobody's reproducing it. We should take some, uh, have Will buff this. 
Look at that, somebody put some pliers on that thing. Ay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Who would do that? I don't know, uh, remind me, I'm gonna go ahead and order the carburetor. I'll call Smith, I'll order up the engine wiring harness, and I think that'll be everything. I'll see if they're reproducing that. But look at that little thing. It's just darling. It's adorable. Cousin Dougie almost bought a 71. Barracuda. Was it? Yeah, 71 yeah. Barracuda uh -huh. with a 318 and a three speed in it, just like that, right yep. before he bought his Grand Coupe pistol grip four speed. And you would have tore that out back then, wouldn't you? You'd have tore it out and found a pistol grip four speed for it. Yeah. The truth, right? Uh huh. Yeah, sure. Animal. I would have borrowed yours. You're a butcher. I didn't have one, <laughs> smart ass. I had a dead dad, a tumor in my foot, and an automatic transmission that slipped between second and third. And eight crayons. I don't like your elevator that slipped eight between crayons. Fours. <laughs> I had seven crayons. Tara broke the yellow one. You have 64 now. Get that thing put together. Yeah. We're gonna rock this town. We're going to rock down to Electric Avenue. Remember that song? Yeah. Ha -ha. Party on, Wayne. So things are cooking along at Graveyard Cars, huh? Yes, yeah, they like are. That. Little Christmas, little Christmas celebration, that's what that's about. She got all painted up. You're supposed to be like an evil elf or something for Santa. I'm like, kind of like a dead elf. The graveyard's kind of taking me over, but then you got the candy canes for Christmas, you know? Yeah, I don't know. You okay. know there's no makeup here, not needed, kind of natural. But you do need it. I don't. Maybe she starts tanning again. Point being, we're doing great and having a lot of fun at Graveyard Cars. now. Willie, young Willie Wonka, finished the paintwork on our 1970 Challenger RT SE 440 in FF4 green. And how many of those were made? 1,288. Yeah, 733, but it's a eh. good guess. Yeah, alternate facts, it's fine. Ish. Down in the body shop, by Curious George is not so curious right now. Your boyfriend. Uh, who's that? Will Scott is over helping by Curious George work on the metal on that that's, car. That's my brother, Dad. Still my brother. Yeah. Brother. Yeah, maybe if you're from another state. Anyway, there are some subtle differences that have to be changed between the 73 to make it look like a 71. They are on it. George and her boyfriend, brother, sorry, Will are on that. Dave kept his nose down, doing a good job on our Superbird. Got the clutch and brake pedal swing arm assemblies installed. Very good. He also has the firewall installation installed on the car and the very unique to the Superbird side markers. Got duct tape been working on the 340 for the 1971 CUDA. 343 speed, FC7, white interior, power top. How many were made? Eight. Ish. Actually, that's the right answer. There were eight made. What? Really? Was that really right? Yeah. Yes. Cool. Huh. The Victims Challenger your old friend, is oh, all friend finished and is going to be unveiled at the Chinook Winds Car Show. That's, That's gonna coming be cool. up, because you get cool. to get drunk. Oh, no, no, you were mistaking me for Will. That's Will. It's going to be the best. No. Going to get so drunk, I ain't going to have a solid stool for a week. Oh, my gosh. Anyway, thanks for okay. watching. See you guys next week. Nice face, nice Thank hair. You. Nice makeup, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hate him. Word. Okay. And I can't do any of my gestures, I've been told, so we're just gonna cut on that. I don't know if you guys were still. Conductee! <laughs>